Okay, before we get into that, we just want to thank Cloud Paper for making this episode happen. Not all toilet paper is created equal. Cloud Paper is made from bamboo, which generates at least 30% less greenhouse gas emissions compared to tree lined toilet paper. But is it comfy, you ask? Okay, maybe TMI, but hell yeah, it is. It's super soft, also super strong, hello, three ply, and lint free. And instead of getting anxiety from sold out toilet paper, you can get cloud paper delivered right to your door and never run out. With subscription options to fit your needs, your order will be shipped free of charge. Try it and cancel anytime. Cloud paper is already low cost, but if you use our code, you get 15% off your first order. Just go to cloudpaper.co and use the code DATABLE to get 15% off. That's cloudpaper.co with the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E to get 15% off. It feels great, it's sustainable, delivered to your door, and less than a dollar per roll with our code. The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Xu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Dateable, a show all about modern dating. We are back again this week for our third episode of the season. Yes, the season has been so killer so far. People keep telling us that, but definitely feel like we've gotten some really great guests this season. Including our guest for this episode, his name is Matt, and we're about to embark into this discussion about the differences (laughs) between heterosex culture and gay sex culture. Obviously, we're not speaking for everyone in these two groups, but it's an interesting discussion to get one person's point of view on some of the key differences. Totally. And this stem because Matt that was an old coworker of mine. And we were just like <laughs> talking about the podcast. And he kept saying how he was just like baffled by hetero views on sex. Like, and he grew up in a super Catholic household. So he like definitely has some theories of his own about why, um, you know, sex culture is the way it is. And I was actually listening to the Armchair Expert, that podcast. Mm-hmm. And they mm-hmm. had Emily yes. Moore. Yep. They had Emily Morse, who's like a really renowned sex with Emily. And she was went into to like it was all about basically how sex is like literally the one thing in the US culture that we just do not talk about. It's like so shameful. It's so like shame ridden. For whatever reason, even in 2021, there's still a huge stigma about talking about sex in predominantly straight culture. And in gay culture, there's just very different views on sex. So we thought it'd be a good topic to kind of explore the dichotomy between the two. You know, when you travel, I mean, I always hear this when I'm in Europe. Um, uh, all the men always say like American women are the most promiscuous. They yes. always they always say that, right? But then they come to the U.S. I've had multiple guy friends tell me they move to the U.S. and then they start dating girls in you know Americans, and they're like they're so prude. They're just nothing like they are when they're abroad. So there is a disconnect because we are kind of prude in this culture, but when we mm-hmm. go abroad, we kind of just let let it all go, and we are <laughs> a lot more sexually free that way. So I do think there is something that we're not exploring here. And I'm glad that we're having this very open sexual discussion. Yeah, or even if we're not prude, because I don't think that like everyone is prude, like, you know, like, speaking for myself, but speaking for other people. But I think it's, there's still this weirdness about talking about sex, like what happens behind closed doors happens behind closed door. And it's almost like if you feel like you are open about sex, you still feel like a little bit of a shame. Like I think about even when we do sex related topics and episodes, I'm like, oh my God, what if like a coworker heard this? Like, mm. I still have that thought go in my mind, even though I think of myself as a pretty sex positive person. There's still like this like scared feeling that someone's going to look down on you if they think that like you're single and you have sex and like, you know, there's it's weird. Well, in terms of like the guy friends I have who have you moved to the US from other parts of the world, they say it's like the the rules that we have around sex. It's Mm -hmm. the whole, oh, if I sleep with this person on a first date, then they won't take me seriously. And they just find that mind boggling because they're like, in my country, you 
just have, yeah. you do have sex and then you don't, ex- you can expect a relationship or you don't, or you, that's how you start a relationship. So the way we view sex as, as a way of, it's a, like a power exchange yes. is very different than other parts of the world. And that's exactly what we dive into in this episode. Like all these like different rules or things that we have been like conditioned to believe all this time. And some of them, Matt definitely was like, okay, I feel this in gay culture too. And others, he was just like, wait, what? <laughs> he was like totally blown away. So we'll let you all hear the episode to hear all the different ones and what he thought about all of them. Again, it's one gay man's perspective. We're not speaking for all gay men. And, but there are definitely some things that we recognize of just having two men versus like a, a female male dynamic, right? Like out of default. And this could be also very different if we talk to two women in lesbian relationships. One thing, though, I think that was super interesting that we did fully get to go through because there was just honestly so much to unpack in this episode but we start he touched on it a little just about like testing with sex and we've talked Mm. about this a bit like in um, our Facebook group and just on the podcast that you know, in straight culture, like asking someone for like an STD test is kind of like you wouldn't do it. Like yeah, a, it's taboo. <laughs> right. But then like with um, testing culture changing with COVID and people like asking for COVID tests, like how will that change in the future in straight culture, but in gay culture, like doing tests or t- doing prep or talking about like your STDs or STIs ahead of time, it's just kind of like run of the course. Like it's not a big deal whatsoever. But they also did go through the AIDS and HIV epidemic, right? So I wonder if after COVID, this will actually start to trickle a lot more into straight culture. I sure hope so, because why have we been doing this whole Russian roulette of SDIs for so long and not knowing how you got something or who gave it to you? And then you just let that person keep... infiltrating with other people. It's just, it's not the right way to do it. And it's not safe. And no matter how, how much we can say, oh, it's like awkward and ruins the moment. Isn't your health and safety a priority in all of this as well? So I, I do hope that the testing culture does change for, for heterosex. So this might be TMI, but have you ever had, (laughs) (laughs) don't you love when it starts that way? Have you ever had to have the conversation with a partner and tell them that you had an STD and basically tell them to get tested because I have it. It's super fucking awkward. Well, tell us about it. <laughs> if we're going to go TMI. Let's do, let's go. No, it was just like, I mean, it was basically like I learned that I had an STD that was obviously curable. So it wasn't the end of the world. But like, I basically had to reach out to past partners of mine. And it was at a stage that I didn't have that many partners. Like there was one guy, it was my, t- I've mentioned him on the podcast, my like toxic friends with benefits. Mm-hmm. So it was basically like my current boyfriend realized that he had, I don't know, I'm not going to get into the whole thing but like basically (laughs) (laughs) well I'm not gonna get into the whole piece of like how I found out but anyways it basically came out that like it probably was from my side and there was really only one person before my current boyfriend so it wasn't like I had to go through like a whole list of people like it could have been a lot worse like I think about that sex of the city episode where Miranda calls like every last person talking about chlamydia so it wasn't like that but I was not exactly on like good terms with this friends with benefits because we were like good friends and it really just went downhill. And I remember like messaging him on Facebook because I had deleted his number. Like, because I was like, oh, can we like chat on the phone for a few minutes? I want to like ask you something or like bring stuff up. I didn't want to like say what it was through Facebook Messenger. Right. And he was like, oh, can you just type it here? Like, basically, like, didn't want to talk to me. And I'm like, no, I'm like, I don't want to talk to you anymore <laughs> than you don't want to talk to me. So, so like, <laughs> can you just trust me that this is going to be like a five minute call? But anyways, he basically like, like, he was like, oh, I don't think this came from me. And then like, I never heard from him after. So I'm like, it totally came from him. It was just a very uncomfortable conversation with especially with someone that you didn't really want to talk to anymore that I had to like hit him up. And I certainly surely as hell would not put that on Facebook Messenger of what I needed to say. That's for damn sure. <laughs> I feel like I had a very similar experience. I had HPV, like every everybody else in college. And when I found out, I told the guy that the the only person I slept with that entire semester, and he was like, it's not for me. <laughs> 
we're like, who else could it be from? I know. Why is that the go-to response? And it like kind of shames you to feel like you're dirty, that you had it. And it's like, first of all, I mean, STDs happen. So I don't want to say anyone's dirty for having an STD. But that's how I felt, I guess, yeah. is a better way to say it. Like the his reaction was so like, well, why would you think this came from me? Yeah. And I'm like, because there's no other path there's of no where other it came person. from. Yes. Like, <laughs> and we didn't use protection. Think about right. that, dumbass. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. But I think there is this fault. And this actually kind of goes into COVID. But like in straight culture, I definitely feel like I'm much better about this now. But like there was a sense of trust that I had like with this friends with benefits. We were not exclusive, yet we were friends. So I was like, Mm. oh, like I totally don't need to like use protection. He's fine. I'm fine. I know him. And I kind of feel like that's like Mm. COVID now. It's like, oh, they're a friend. They don't have COVID. I don't need to wear a mask. But that is like a false sense of security. There's really nothing different between your friend versus versus some rando on Tinder. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And people will say whatever they want to yes. make you feel comfortable. And and they maybe sometimes they actually think that's the truth too, because they haven't been tested. They just assume so. Mm-hmm. It's just one of those like really awkward conversations. I mean, I, I remember when I was dating, I would just be like, hey, if we're not going to use protection. Just want to make sure that we're only sleeping with each other, right? And of course, <laughs> they're like, yeah, of course. But yep. who, I mean, who knows? <laughs> I can't verify that. I do want to say though, this friends with benefits that I bring up, he did reach out recently when the New York Times article came out. Oh, I was like, because he he finally (laughs) finally admitted Um, that he had the STI. I'm it's pretty like 10 sure. Years later, yeah. I was like, this has been like a good five years. No more. It's been like eight years. You know, it was it was a nice message. I'm like, you don't know how much um material you've given on the podcast. You really have <laughs> ch- changed so much. You are so influential. As the mistake I would never do ever again that I learned so much from. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, next. (laughs) Oh my, I did not expect that conversation to go that way. I love it. But let's let's bring it back to something that's not so TMI. We just had (laughs) the most exciting, interesting, uh, amazing virtual event, the most dateable competition. It was our rendition of a virtual co-ed pageant, per se. And we had six contestants, three judges. Judges. It was one night. It happened last week. And it was probably the most fun I had, I had in a really long time. I looked forward uh-huh. to it. Julie and I both dressed up in sparkles. The judges dressed up. The contestants had wardrobe changes. It was one of those nights that I, I felt like it was an award ceremony. It was just so fun. It really was. And I, I do want to commend you again, because I think that you really did pull a lot of weight in this. Because I think this is like, this is what lights you up. I could definitely see of the things we do, you love love, love, love <laughs> shit like this. So I'm so glad we were able to do it. And you did such a great job managing all of the contestants and judges and all of that. And I was blown away by the contestants. Like, oh. I don't know if you had a little more insight, because I know you've been primarily the one talking to them. But like, I just did not, I don't know, this stuff can be amateur hours sometimes. Like, I knew they were obviously vetted. Like, we got hundreds of submissions. We had people look at them. Like, there was clearly like a, a reason why these people were picked. But I still was a little skeptical of like what the talent would actually look like but I was seriously blown away by all of it like the dancing the comedy like singing like it was out of control in addition to the glitz and glamour it was also about vulnerability I feel Mm -hmm. like all six of our contestants are at some sort of crossroads in their life and they were so honest and open with what they're going through and the personal development stuff that they were working Mm -hmm on. It it was very humbling for us to see and hear. I think the judges were blown away too. I mean, they they messaged us after was like, we did not expect any of this. (laughs) No, no one did. And I do want to shout out our judges. We had Mei Lee, Misha Byrak, and Dr. Abigail Lev, who have been crowd favorites on Dateable. Probably remember Mei Lee. She's a former CNN journalist and correspondent. And we had her on the Can You Have It All episode. Mm -hmm. Misha Byrak was the art of virtual sex Ow. with him. <laughs> and he runs like virtual sex parties and more of like, you know, sex positive communities. And Dr. 
Dr. Abigail Lev is the schemas expert, like how you're wired for relationships, our top episode of last season. We talk about her all the time. So we had like this like A plus roster of judges. And I feel like they all complimented each other in so many different ways. It was just absolutely magic that happened when we had all three of them giving commentary and everyone has such a different take and commentary. It was just, it made the night so magical for me. And I got to hand it over to everybody who put themselves out there. It was a very Mm -hmm. courageous thing to do. We had lots of people on this, on this call, I'm going to call it on this call, but it was actually part of the show (laughs) and the audience. I mean, the chat was on fire. People were just like, what is happening? I did not expect this. So for all six of our contestants, congratulations for putting your heart out there and opening yourself up to everyone who was part of this um, a part of the audience. It was a really special night to witness. Yeah, we are actually selling the recording for anyone that missed this. A few of us, a few of you have asked like, hey, I wasn't able to attend and make Thursday night happen. Can I still catch this in the recording? So you can actually get tickets in air quotes. <laughs> it's datablepodcast.com slash events. It will be at a discounted price because obviously the live component is removed. But honestly, I'm going to rewatch it. One of our <laughs> community members, Caitlin, she mentioned like, it's a great date activity, like to watch something <laughs> yeah. like this, you know, and like one of our other community members, Shelby, like she mentioned, like, she's like, this is the live event we've all been craving the last yes. year. And like, it, it was so clear, like how much we've missed like comedy, live music, dance productions, like, you know, but also with heart, like it wasn't mm-hmm. just like a like a talent rundown, like there was just so much dynamic to it. That was it was just so much fun. I'm gonna well, I want to do a screening of it, you know, <laughs> invite a few people virtually and watch it again, over and over again, really, it was just such a fun night. So I can't wait for any of you who missed it to to watch it or for anyone of you who wants to relive that night, because I certainly do. Should we reveal the winner? Should we wait till next week to reveal the winner? I think we should reveal look- the winner. Okay. I think if you're part of the community, you already know, congratulations to Brian Clark, or should we say Tinnifer? It was a, a joint <laughs> effort. You'll know what we mean if you watch the show. Uh, he uh, he won. He Mr. Brian Clark is most dateable 2021. He really surprised us with his vulnerability. And, you know, for that first round, it was all about showcasing why you're dateable. And Julie, like, I wouldn't even know what I would do. I might, you know, no. I was like, that. that is like a really hard task we gave them. And all six of them interpreted it so differently. Brian put his heart out there and told this very heartwarming story that made us cry. We were, Julie and I were crying within like yeah. 10 minutes of the show. <laughs> I know, I was like, my ma- I did make up for once and my mascara is <laughs> running. <laughs> it was just so touching to hear his journey and his talent competition was so hilarious. Oh my God. Um, and the Q&A, he did such an awesome job with the Q&A and I just, I just love Brian. I love all six contestants and I'm so happy for all of them to be part of this. And again, a big congratulations to Brian for winning this title. Yeah, we got to get Brian on the show. He was phenomenal. Phenomenal. (laughs) He's so great. He's so great. And what's so wonderful is that we have such a strong sounding board community presence Mm -hmm. in this during this event. And that's why we love the sounding board. And I guess we can go into announcements now. This is really something we talk about every week. The sounding board is an extension of our Facebook community. So it is a premium community. We offer premium content as well as interactions, Mm -hmm. but it's been so worth it to be along for the ride because everyone's, it's a very close knit community. We are not just basic. (laughs) We go deep into the whys of people's behavior. We are each other's sounding board. We are each other's guide through everything that we're going through right now, especially with COVID and dating. It's just been such a wonderful community to be part of. So if you are interested in joining, you can find out more information at datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. And uh, as part of the community, we also have a book club. And this month's book club, we're featuring our very own Logan Yuri, her bestseller book. It's called How Not to Die Alone. If you want to get in on the action, join the sounding board, datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. 
Yeah, this is going to be a special one because normally in our book clubs, we don't have like the authors there. But Logan offered to come because she did the episode with us last week. And she's a huge member of the Dateable fam. But we do have our monthly fireside chats with guests and Logan was one before. But this will be a very special event. But I do want to read one quote that I got that Shieldy, one of our members, messaged me after the event and was just like, this event was amazing. I enjoyed myself so much. But then it got sentimental. And I was like, you know, I'm (laughs) reading this online. She's like, okay. (laughs) So she basically said, like, "Um, your podcast has literally changed my life. I have a family. And family, she means the sounding board family. The virtual family. (laughs) Not like an actual family, but she had that before. (laughs) And then she's like, a great boyfriend. And yes, that happened naturally. But you influenced me to open my heart and mind to new people. I started listening around season six, and it's wild that we're on season 12. So much growth. Oh, we love you, Shieldy. And also, you know, we are the ones who put the information out there, but you're also the one receiving and you have yes. to be open to receiving this information. Some people are not at a point in their life to receive this yet, and that's mm-hmm. perfectly okay. But that's why we love the sounding board because it's a group of people who are at the exact same phase in their lives to receive this and to grow with this information. So we mm-hmm. appreciate all of you so much. When we love you, Shieldy, we really, really do. You are family <laughs> to us. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Is that enough for our announcements? Oh, yeah. Just one very last thing. There is a little confusion. So I just want to clarify. We do have the general public Facebook group, which is Love in the Time of Corona, and then the sounding board, which UA just mentioned. So anyone can join Love in the Time of Corona. Well, I shouldn't say anyone. As long as you're a listener, as long as you fill out the like the quick questionnaire, we're trying to like not have it be like total internet randos. But you get what I mean. It is a free group to join. As long as you tell us a little about yourself, we'll admit you. And in, in that group, it's like, you know, the basic stuff that happens with Facebook groups. There's posts, all of the um, people can ask questions. Our moderator, Janice, does like recaps of the episodes. I mean, it's a really great community. People love the time, of, love in the time of Corona in itself. But the sounding board is kind of like where the true magic happens. That's where the happy hours are and podcast discussion groups. That's where people like chat via video. That's when like the real friendships start to form. But also there is the ability to go to the events that we have like the most dateable. It won't be that 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 was kind of like our flagship big event for the year but we will we do have our every month we have workshops or fireside chats with past dateable guests so that's all within the sounding board fabulous all right well we really like to thank our sponsor BetterHelp for making this episode happen for the new year what are some things that you like to change in your life to find more happiness what do you think is preventing you from achieving your goals we think the simple answer is prioritizing your mental health we at Dateable are huge fans of therapy and BetterHelp can match you with your own licensed therapist and connect you in a safe and private online environment so I was able to start communicating with my therapist in less than 48 hours it's super Super fast. They're committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Their licensed professionals specialize in everything from stress, New Year's resolutions, anxiety, trauma, depression, and grief, you name it. They will help you through it. For the new year, we wish for all of you to live a happier life. That's why as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash dateable. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. And we have another message that's from our podcast network called Frolic Network. We love to feature some new podcasts for y'all to listen to that we've really enjoyed. This one this week we want to feature is Tea and Strumpets. Tune in to hear two friends discuss all the steamy details of the Regency romance genre. So what is a Regency romance genre? I had to look this up, Julie. It's a subgenre of romance novels set during the period of the British Regency or the Mm. early 19th century. Now, traditional Regencies feature a great deal of intelligent, fast-paced dialogue between 
between the protagonist and very little explicit sex or discussion of sex. Mm, interesting. Mm. So join them each episode as they take a trip across the pond and into the past in search of swoon-worthy happily ever afters. They talk about all your Regency favorites like Julia Quinn's Bridgertons. Plus, mm. they dive deep into exciting new releases. The Tea and Strumpets podcast also features full book reviews and fabulous interviews with best-selling authors in the genre like. You can find them on the Frolic Network or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Awesome. So shall we get into it with Matt now? Let's do it. All right, so we often talk about how we all view sexuality a little bit differently. We talk, we view sex a little differently, but we've noticed there are some drastic differences between the way we view sex, hetero views on sex, and gay views on sex. And our guest today is here to represent one voice of that, <laughs> but it's a very interesting discussion to basically flip your perspective on sex and see what other people are thinking. So we have Matthew Byer. He is in in his late 30s. He lives in San Francisco. And he's been there for seven years, originally from Duluth, Minnesota. Oh, I didn't know there was a Duluth, Minnesota. Yep. <laughs> he's currently in an open relationship, a novelist and a screenwriter. He has a book called The Breeders, all about a dystopian world when the gays have taken over genetic engineering. And in my eyes, it just means the gays have taken over the norm of society yes, that's and correct. what that could possibly look like. Hello, Matthew. Hello. Nice to meet you. And hello, Julie. Hello. Yeah. So Matt and I know each other. For, we are friends. And this whole thing kind of came about because I was ta- we were talking about the podcast and I was kind of sharing like the scandalous stories that we've <laughs> talked about. And you're like, wait, you know, like, I just had like a casual six way the other day. Like, this is like, <laughs> like, what? Like, you know, we, and I remember you being like, I'm fascinated by just like, what's deep down rooted in sex for hetero folks. So yep. we were like, we should do an episode where we talk about just like, how you view things, how we've seen things. And like, again, it's one person's opinion, we're not going to say that you represent all gay men. But we also have pulled our community too. So we've got a few other voices too for Okay. straight folks and for gay folks. So I think it's a really interesting convo. And like, as we're a polyar community, it got me even more excited to do this recording. Yeah, it'll <laughs> be interesting. And yeah, I just want to say, you know, I, again, just one person in the gay community. Um, but I did come from the Midwest yeah, to yes. San Francisco, where it's an entirely different world. So I've kind of seen both sides of it and also a ton of different types of people. So not everyone likes to be as open uh, in relationships or in discussions as I do, but I kind of think this topic is very important because I think people shove it under the rug so much, but they're still doing all these things or having all these thoughts secretly and then they don't admit to it or are ashamed of it. And I'm kind of fascinated by the the creation of that culture where it comes from. Is it religious, you know, created by religious culture or, you know, all of the above? So so it's a topic I'm very interested in. That's a really hefty topic <laughs> for sure. I want to bring us back to, and we can all share sort of like, when did you first come to realize what sexuality was? Because I I was a horny kid, but I didn't tie it to sexuality. I was just <laughs> totally. like, I love touching myself. I love putting a pillow <laughs> between my legs and that's yep. hot, like that feels good. But I didn't call it sex, you know, because I was like Yeah, six. I didn't know why. Basically, in middle school is, is when I tied it all together by reading a book called Do Over, where hmm. this <laughs> it's a book written for tweens about how this girl goes on this sexual exploration where she's touching herself and then her classmates have touched her, I mean, with, with consent and how pleasurable <laughs> it was. And I remember reading that like it was a porno. That was like a porno for me back in the day. And I would read it and I would fantasize about all the different scenes that she's talking about. So that's when I connect the, hmm. the ta- dots. I would love to hear from both of you. When did you first connect the dots? Yeah, I mean, I can go first if you want. Um, I would say when I was 11 and the internet happened, um, <laughs> that's when I officially connected the dots and you know started learning about it in school and everything. I think it was before fifth grade. And then when I was in fifth grade, we did the quote, quote, family life unit. And this is in Catholic school. So it was very much... God doesn't want you to masturbate. Sex is only for marriage. So it was very much rooted in the Catholic point of view. 
Yeah. Um, so I, of course, was very ashamed of it. But I did want to comment. When I was very young, I used to watch wrestling and like really like oh. the muscly dudes. But I didn't know why. Again, it was just mm. like, you know, I had no idea what that was. But I think combining that with the kind of shame associated with growing up Catholic with that point of view. But I, in my adult life, kind of look back on that and, you know, everything felt so guilty and wrong. Had it been a healthier culture, in my opinion, of Mm -hmm. saying, no, this is okay. Like you're a person and everyone goes through this. That would have been a very positive experience. And I think a lot of at least gay kids coming out today, I know a few in the Bay Area who they have a much easier time of it um, because it's okay. And it's, that's just how people are. So it's a kind of different, different experience than what I had. But wait, I don't know if I know this, but did you have any sexual experiences with women or was like your first <laughs> nope. one with men? I'm a virgin. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> a virgin just no, with women. Yeah, I'm just I'm putting that much, out there. Yeah. <laughs> but you yep. never hooked up with an Asian girl because that's the gateway. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I had one girlfriend. She's a wonderful human being. And looking back, I still feel just bad that I wasn't brave enough to come out in mm. high school, but we only kissed once and it was super awkward you're like not doing <laughs> the it kiss for itself me. Yeah. was you know she's wonderful but my brother's friends were like why aren't you kissing her why don't you kiss her why don't you kiss her and it was a whole year of that and it was just i was mortified the whole time and that was just you know it's okay it my yeah. <laughs> my uh like prom date was came out later in life like okay. i think i was de- like definitely a similar situation that okay, yeah. everyone's like why aren't you making the moves and then like as like a young person you're like why aren't they making yeah. the moves you <laughs> That's know? So sad. And, and then I like later I... <laughs> on i learned that he came out of like oh that makes a lot that more sense, sense now yeah. but i guess like for me i'm like i'm trying honestly my memory is so shot from younger life i was like talking about this the other day i just don't remember shit but I grew up, I don't, I honestly can't re- like you asked when's the first time I connected the dots and I have no idea. But I do know that like I grew up in a very conservative, like socially conservative household that we mm-hmm. never talked about sex. Like I was told the stork brought me for years and it was oh, yeah. never like a sex as like a pleasure thing. Like I just remember sex is bad from like sex ed. And I think it took, honestly, it took me to like college to like really understand that this was was like a thing like it, I just it, yeah I was just living under a rock for like most of my early adult life or not adult life teen life Did, were you aware of it and then the other people were doing it or was it well actually I was definitely aware of it I was <laughs> this is hilarious uh, my family used to like steal cable and we would like be watching a movie and then all of a sudden like porn would shoot through it was like one of those cable boxes so I was aware of it my parents would be like cover your eyes you know so <laughs> that's nothing <laughs> anyways I don't know if I was like turned on by it more confused and horrified at the moment of it like coming through my movie that I was in the middle of but (laughs) and did you and curious for you two when did you realize there was a difference between heterosex and gay sex because to me it was all the same up until I think college I just felt like it was anatomy touching anatomy and I didn't think there was a difference in like your choice of sexuality oh that's interesting Mm. um yeah Julie you on that. I would love to hear your thoughts back because you were okay, more living well, and breathing <laughs> this, but I think I'll just like touch yeah, really quick. Definitely. But like, honestly, I didn't really think that much of it. I think like also the generation we grew up and like the conservative place I was in, I wasn't exposed to it that much. Mm. So I don't know. I mean, I mean, my prom date was closeted the whole time. So it's like, I don't think it was like really <laughs> out in the open. Um, So honestly, I just didn't think about it. I'll just be transparent with that. Yeah, yeah I definitely <laughs> did um i I would hope (laughs) okay so i grew up with you know my my parents are lovely people they're very catholic they were like the sex ed teacher in ccd which is a catholic thing and so my mom was the one who did all the like sex talks and like it's marriage and this and that so my friends still talk about that but they love my mom and she's a great person um but i so we kind of grew up where people who who dated when they were quote quote while well, they were kids but like <laughs> to them they were going out you know like sixth seventh grade we had this kind of terror instilled in us of like how bad that was because it could lead to sex which could lead to unwanted pregnancies and since abortion is super wrong that's terrible and so i they would 
argue that that's not what they meant to instill in us. Um, and I totally give them that, but we were aware of sex and the, what could happen with sex. So I would say when I was 11 is kind of when yahoo.com happened. And that was a search engine. And I was awake at night. I love that you're like explaining to people what yahoo.com is. as someone that worked there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, totally. like, Julie worked oh. there for many years. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, that was the first search engine where I was searching things I shouldn't have been at that age. And <laughs> Glad Yahoo could have done that for you. Yes. Honestly, I credit the internet with me discovering who I was, which mm-hmm. is actually a serious thing because I had no role model. So I had mm-hmm. no nobody to show me what was okay okay or what was you know even normal because there was no normal for me so i was was searching what i thought i should be searching and then i saw the dudes and i was like oh "Oh, that's way more interesting (laughs) and you know i had always liked looking at dudes but i didn't know what it meant up until then roughly given that we were very aware in my family of sex and what it meant and marriage and babies and the kind of catholic approach I remember being 11 or 12 and just terrified of what my life would look like as a gay person, because in my head, what other option was there than having a wife and kids? Mm. And what would life be? It would be this empty, sad thing where I just was in my mid 20s drifting toward death or whatever. (laughs) You know, like I didn't see it as an opportunity, whereas now um, I'm very, very thankful for the lack of social structure that Mm -hmm. that provided, which allowed me. And it kind of is in line with my personality to explore who I was. And that doesn't mean I don't, you know, measure myself against social norms sometimes. And I sometimes fall into that trap, but it's been a really positive thing. But back then, yeah, it was absolutely terrifying for me. I can't blame it on Midwest as a whole, but it's the culture there was just very, very different. I mean, honestly, it's so much more mainstream now, right? Like, thanks, like with media and just the internet, like everything. But I do think the Midwest is slightly less progressive than say like San Francisco, which has always been kind of like the Mecca, right? Yeah. And it reaches the Midwest, I'd say five to 10 years in. Right. And that's my experience comparing it since I moved here. I mean, even like in straight world, we see that, right? Like Mm -hmm. polyamory and stuff that's so, you know, that you're just like, whatever, this is the normal. Yeah. (laughs) But in (laughs) San Francisco, at least it's more progressive than the Midwest for sure. But I guess like in your book that you talked about, I remember you were telling me about the book and you're like, there's just a scene where like gay people are having sex like at bus stops just like (laughs) anywhere you know and um, I'm curious like what are kind of like your main perceptions of the difference between gay sex and heterosex well mechanics aside I would say (laughs) like um well in the book when I talk about that it's kind of a satire and it was inspired by the National Organization for Marriages ad campaign equating gay marriage to this coming storm. So I was writing that book with the intent of poking and prodding. So I was like, what's the worst thing that could happen? And that'd be like public sex at the bus stops. And, (laughs) you know, and it would be a normal thing that everyone would see. So um, that's where that came from. But that said, I it's definitely removed from reality in the sense that that's a crime and you (laughs) go to prison and, you know, but you go to San Francisco for Folsom Street fair which i've actually never been to but i was been to the the before party thing at the leather store which isn't usually my thing but the party was really fun anyway you see people doing roughly the same thing and it's totally fine and san francisco i would say uh it's kind of normal people wouldn't bat an eyelash as much i don't think at that sort of thing no yeah people are just like yeah. walking naked on the street yeah <laughs> and it's like and it's fine oh. and why is that a shameful yeah, thing we're like, why no is he not exposing his penis it's weird <laughs> <laughs> he has pants on yes. but i do remember when i first moved here i was like what is going on and <laughs> yeah. honestly it does usually tend to be gay men like not to generalize yeah. but it does so like which yeah I agree. And I think I can only speak from my own perception of that phenomenon. A lot of us spent our much of our lives being in the closet or not being able to express ourselves or something. And this is kind of, or San Francisco rather, is like a safe haven, I would say, mm-hmm. for gay people. Yep. And and there is a reason my aunt, when I was 12 years old, was making fun of gay people out in San Francisco. And it was known even in the Midwest that mm-hmm. San Francisco is where people went to 
and they were all gay and it was Mm -hmm. people said that to me when i moved from boston they're like are you gonna become a lesbian now i'm like what like how are you just kidding yeah Yeah, i'm like no i'm just yeah at 25 i'm just gonna decide because i you know like what the fuck because people (laughs) decide i I never thought about san francisco being a haven for lesbians (laughs) it was just an ignorant comment (laughs) (laughs) lots of those in the world and i'm probably gonna make many tonight so we'll see i'll try not to but yeah i think regarding the the fact that there's like public sex and the gay thing i i think i can only link it to the fact that people feel safe being a little more out and out there here versus elsewhere maybe Mm -hmm. um and also i think there's the element of gay people have to come out and tell people and say hey look this is my sexuality in a way that straight people don't because it's kind of understood, I think. Right. So I think the experience of being gay and having to not just wear it on your sleeve outwardly every day, but have to announce it because other people will just otherwise assume you're straight or make a rash judgment that you're gay, even if you might not be, you know, because mannerisms or all these things that they think represent gay well, yeah, we have a few, sure. yeah, we have a few scenarios that we at least we've come, we feel are there's shifts, there's differences between perception uh-huh. between straight and gay folks. We'll kind of run through these different scenarios, okay. but would love your take on them as obviously, again, single, like one person, we're not saying that you represent gay folks overall, but like just your experience yourself, and then also with all the people in your life that you've observed too. So I guess I'll kick off the first one. I think I think there is something that's really interesting with um, heterosex, like views on sex. There's like this exchange for power, essentially, that like women don't want to sleep with men too early because then they'll lose interest. Like men also, the, like we've talked to people in our community too, that they were saying like, I don't want to feel like manipulated by a woman because she's like holding out sex. So there's like a lot of like weird power dynamics that play into sex, opposed to two people just like enjoying their physical time together like do you ever see this in like gay culture no i want to say and again this is just me but i've that's a kind of foreign concept to me i'm just thinking here if i've ever experienced anything like that i think it tends to be more like a handshake and then you get to know each other so you hook up first (laughs) and then get to know each other and i could see maybe uh in a relationship it's not really a power play but there is like yes and no dynamics like if you're not in the mood or something and you can say no and i actually think in my experience in the gay community and relationships it's kind of it is hypersexualized in a lot of ways that that's sort of standard that i think people both embrace and sometimes measure themselves against or just you know it's expected to just have sex or whatever um and again not for everybody but in terms of using that as a or using sex as a power play thing that to me is foreign unless you're fetishizing power play mm. and that's a totally different thing <laughs> right whole, uh, whole other yeah. <laughs> i've had this conversation extensively with some of my gay besties in new york who said we've always observed that a lot of their relationships that I've seen throughout the years stem from sex. Sex is yes. what kicked off their relationships. Yep. Mm-hmm. But in a lot of hetero relationships, especially mine, I hold off sex to have a relationship. And I remember like going on a date with this guy once and then my my gay best friend came and met up with me after and he's like, did you see that dick? And I was like, no, I barely <laughs> I barely saw his face. You know, like we were just at a dark bar. And you he's mean you like, didn't see the, you didn't see the dick on text first? Right. And just he kidding. was like, oh, why did you even go on the date? And, and then I told him <laughs> I was holding out for sex because I really liked him and I really wanted to get to know him. And he yep. was like, girl, I just don't don't understand like what if his dick is disgusting it's true <laughs> what if it's small what if he's ho- what if he it smells like don't you want to know on date number zero before you even go on date it's number valid. one and it was a super valid point and it made me kind of think like why do i feel like holding out for sex would make the guy like me more but i guess in your experience have you ever done any sort of game playing non-fetishized game playing to make <laughs> someone like you more or like you back i like how you preface it and not yeah, finish it well i think i don't not consciously but i think my own insecurities as a person i can be very self-deprecating so i would say well i do try to be very sincere in my profiles or whatever 
um, because that is something I'm attracted to in another person is sincerity and not, you know, playing the game. I don't like when people are not genuine with me and I can usually sense that pretty quickly. So I would say uh, maybe subconsciously I've tried to present myself in the best light I can. Mm, Um, We all have. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a normal (laughs) human thing. Um, But again, I, I don't really relate. I don't think off the top of my head, I don't really relate to that concept. Let's take a really quick break and we'll get right back into Matt. Um, UA, let's take it away with a couple of our sponsors. Here's a special message from our sponsor, Gobble. Do you remember at the beginning of the pandemic when everyone was like super pumped about cooking and sharing their food photos, right? Remember that? And like a million months later, no one's posting their food photos anymore because we're all so freaking sick of cooking. I know at least for me, I just need variety in my meals and I can't accomplish that by just cooking on my own. That is why Gobble is the perfect meal delivery solution because you can whip up delicious and healthy meals in 15 minutes or less. Gobble and listen, arm of sous chefs that do the time-consuming work for you. And we just tried the miso glazed salmon and it was divine. Everything comes with pre-portioned fresh ingredients such as already chopped veggies, spice blends, and perfectly simmer sauces. Just pick meals from Gobble's extensive menu each week, including a variety of flavors, classic dishes, global recipes, and delicious vegetarian options, plus a line of lean and clean recipes featuring low-calorie and low-carb options. And by the way, they also have breakfast and desserts. Yeah, that's right. See what a difference gobble will make for your household they're offering our listeners this fantastic limited time deal for six meals for just 36 dollars plus free shipping that's dinner for two people for three nights all for just 36 bucks an offer only available through gobble.com slash datable get this special offer now by going to gobble.com slash d-a-t-e-a-b-l-e for six meals 36 bucks So I thought this was interesting that like one of our community members, Amy, I believe she identifies as bisexual. So she was making a comment how there's a lot of playbooks and like recipes for like Mm. women, heterosexual relationships, but in her like same sex relationships, that doesn't exist as much. Like, do you have any thoughts on just like, I mean, I guess it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier, like this no rules mentality. Like, do you have any thoughts of like if how that would play into this whole like game playing mentality that we're talking about yeah well i again i am not a gamer in this sense at all like it's super unattractive to me um but i would say yeah it does get back to the fact like for me that there there were no rules to go by i just had mm. like gay.com and then grinder which were <laughs> <laughs> that actually was a website back in the day when i was Straight first to the coming point. out <laughs> yeah. yeah and it was you know there was no playbook of any sort. So I think it was a lot of self-discovery. And, you know, I think there's some measuring oneself against what you see and what other people are doing. And, oh, am I going to fit in or not? Like, I feel like I don't fit in a lot of the time in general, not just with this, (laughs) but I think general personalities and individual insecurities can play into this. Um, yeah, I, the concept of a playbook, is that like pickup lines or like how to bag a guy or like what's yeah. that? Yeah, women right. got okay. like growing up, I think women and men in straight land, not just okay. women, but like there was, you know, Cosmopolitan magazine that would just have all these like rules and games that you yeah. had to play by. And then there were like books like why men marry bitches, like terrible like <laughs> things, the just... rules. And then like men would get it from um like – maxim magazine and gq and all that stuff so there was just howard stern like there was a lot of like game playing and like tactics that were well known that people felt they had to abide by which brings it to why like women kind of feel like there's like this coveted prize of sex where it doesn't sound like that exists as much in gay culture do you think that that has anything to do with um i don't not necessarily misogyny but like Yes, I do think it has to do with misogyny. Okay, so in my head, I'm trying to articulate, like, the prize at the end of the day is to, like, fuck a woman, and then you've you've won, you know? Like, that's, like, yeah, that's what we're all going for, dudes, or whatever. That's my interpretation of straight land, but, like... (laughs) That's um, what straight land sounds like. Um, I want to say it seems like that's where some of that comes from, at least in my point of view. Is that a thing that you guys think, or is it just 
Yeah, I mean, I think some of it, too, is like what women have been taught to along the way. So, I mean, I think there's an interesting dynamic. We're obviously talking about your perspective as a gay man, like lesbian women might have very different perspectives on some of this because there's some of this that's, you know, outside of, you know, gay straight, but just like women, men and what we've been taught growing up as women and men. So yeah. it's interesting that like maybe that dynamic shifts a little when you two, when you pair two men versus like the woman and the man. Like you have like the historic like kind of I don't want to say weak, but like kind of like this like the feminine stereotypical feminine way of like being more submissive and then the male being more dominant is what at least like the old school misogyny brought up. Yeah. And then there's this other notion of sex related to shame in yeah. the hetero culture the date the dating culture um <laughs> i mean i'm just looking at sorry i had to look up like some of the most popular gay dating apps and yeah. you compare those names to those of hetero apps you're like holy <laughs> shit squirt uh jack <laughs> is that a top app oh yeah yes. i've seen jacked before hornets <laughs> um what's this one growler <laughs> surge <laughs> Uh, Scruff and cha- Grinder, Chappy, like Scruff, the ones, Grinder, yeah. they're all very much sex forward. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. if you look at hetero apps, Bumble, Bumble, what the fuck is Bumble? <laughs> Hinge, it's like safe. what is that? Coffee meets bagel, like how much more PG <laughs> can you get than these names? But there, why is there so much? I can't. I'm obviously we can't answer this in like the next thirty minutes. There is still shame tied <laughs> mm-hmm. to sex for hetero dating but in gay dating there doesn't seem to be that shame attached so mm-hmm. have you i guess my question to you is have you ever felt shame attached to to sex and, absolutely oh, oh yes yeah. okay, okay. Tell us what's more. your next tell question <laughs> I'll, I'll get into that, though. please expand on that okay um well and if you remember what you're gonna ask i sorry i interrupted you i was gonna say yes absolutely and i think it took me into my late 20s to remove that shame. So I had the general Catholic premarital sex shame, Mm -hmm. but since I can't get truly married in the Catholic church, which I'm not part of anymore, but back then I knew I could never get married. So on top of that, being gay was this quote, quote, unnatural thing. It's, you know, it's not unnatural to be gay, but the act of gay sex is not, the Catholic church or, and you know, whatever religion, I don't know. It's not something they embrace. Um, And so that shame, it was kind of a double whammy of shame. So I think as I was exploring and as a teenager, it was just like the internet and porn because that's what was there. Um, I never had the courage to, I don't even know where I would have had sex when I was that age. Um, there were some people in high school, but I was also super closeted. So I was trying to deflect at yeah. all turns, you know? So yeah, the the shame thing. But I wanted to touch on the fact that I think coming out again, it's kind of about the we have to come out. So therefore you you have to put this part of yourself forward. And uh, there might be some link and I'm can't pretend to be scientific about it, but between that type of shamelessness and purposeful shamelessness to try to be proud of who you are, it's almost like saying, no, I'm not going to be ashamed of this. And then as that progresses in culture, so, um, and I'm just kind of thinking through this right now, but in culture, I think that may have, it's very possible that apart from just putting two guys together where guys are kind of pigs a lot of the time. And then you just exponentially increase that. Um, There's no real give and take from the sexes or whatever, you know, maybe combined with the fact that we did have to be more open about our sexuality. So therefore we're going to fight that shame that followed us up through childhood. Um, So there's, there's a lot of, I think baggage there, (laughs) Um, at least for me, I'm probably not for kids who grow up in a very, you know, warm, welcoming environment. I hope not for them. And, but yeah, for me, I think there's baggage attached to it that was something to overcome, uh, which then kind of opened the doors to not having to feel ashamed because that was no longer part of who I was or wanted to be, if that makes any sense. 
That's so interesting. It's like, I mean, there's definitely the shame even in straight land, right? Of like Mm -hmm. growing up thinking sex is bad, like I mentioned, or when I mentioned, like I thought like the stork brought me, right? So it's like this (laughs) has been like this closeted piece in even straight world too. But I think at least what we see, and this is interesting because I feel like you would think in like 2021 that this wouldn't be a thing anymore. But like when the woman does sleep with the man too soon, there is this feeling of shame. Like I did something wrong and that kind of goes back to like those playbooks and all that stuff we were talking about earlier like do you ever feel that type of shame or is it more just the shame from like growing up i would say at you know in the beginning of my adulthood it would it's probably it was probably more similar to that in the sense of this is bad sex is bad i shouldn't have let myself do that um, except at the same time, I was having a great time <laughs> and I slowly realized, uh, you know, maybe that's okay. And I think, sorry, can you repeat your question? No, I mean, I think straight people have similar. I think maybe we just took a little longer to get there. Cause I mean, I think obviously sex now is more out in the open than it was even like five, 10 years ago, but it's still not as out in the open as it is in gay culture. At least that's the perception that I have. Yeah. Um, I would, I would agree on that. And in terms, yeah, in terms of the shame factor, I think it's, it was for me very intertwined with the internalized homophobia that I grew up with. So I, it's, it's hard for me to separate that experience. Um, but I definitely did feel it, you know, as I got to realize that, oh, a lot of people are doing this and, oh, maybe it's, maybe it's okay. And, oh, I just met friends doing this like okay you hook up once and then you see each other again it's like oh cool let's hang out and you had mentioned this earlier like meeting friends through sex that's been my experience so often i can barely count (laughs) like having friends and people i really care about long term whether they're just peripheral facebook friends or they actually become close Mm -hmm. um, i'm really close friends with one of my semi exes i want to say um he was living out east when i was in minnesota and now we're we text almost every day and he's one of the best people i know and multiple other friends like that so i think as i witnessed a positive result of sex i was able to slowly detach these shame like shame related ideas if that makes sense mm. that's mm-hmm. interesting cuz i feel like with I don't know. I don't hear as that many people like having sex with people and staying friends at, in like straight world. Yeah. Like yeah, I feel like that. Rare. Yeah, it's like okay. definitely one of those things that it's more like you keep it separate. Do you think that has anything to do with dating, family? Like I feel like there's a potentially different paradigm that sex is obviously linked to family creation. And I, I wonder if maybe that's related to that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's never the guy that doesn't want to stay friends. Right. It's usually <laughs> the women who are yep, like, I'm not comfortable. And you said something earlier that piqued my interest too, was the give and take dynamic of, um, I put in the context of heterosex, mm-hmm. is that I think a lot of women, speaking for myself here, is I feel like I'm the taker <laughs> and I'm taking it in. And um, it's like sex almost puts me in danger in some ways because there is a body part put into me Mm -hmm. and that puts me at risk for tear, that puts me uh, at risk for damage, uh, that puts me at risk for unwanted pregnancy. So there's a lot of risk involved. And I think for me, why I attach some shame to sex is that do I let this casual encounter put me at risk in this. Yep. And it's it, to me, it's biological that this is, you know, that they're putting me in danger. And I, I chose to be put into this position. That brings up an interesting point. I think one of the differences with the casual nature of this, I think one of the differences with the casual nature of sex between guys versus maybe men and women, there is a safety factor to consider. And I think that's that's a huge thing. And I think it shouldn't be discounted. You know, I have a little sister. Well, she's not little. She's 30 something now <laughs> in New York. She'll always be the little sister. Yeah. You know, she's been, uh, she's had to, just people on the street say things to her and like to make actions. And it's stuff women go through all the time, which is just horrendous. At the same time, I say that 
if you put a bunch of gay guys at a street party, everyone's checking each other out and like right. have a hand on the small of your back or wherever else very quickly, you know? Mm-hmm. So I say it's terrible when it's my sister or a woman. So there's a double standard there that I'm actively trying to acknowledge. But uh, yeah, I think safety, that said, it's also a thing in gay culture. You know, I've had situations where I put myself in a situation that I regretted after and there, mm-hmm. you know, Whether you call it assault or you call it an accident or you tell yourself it wasn't an assault, I've struggled with those things too that I think women go through a lot more often. There's differences there that have a, that need to be acknowledged, I think, um, just because it's just reality, if that makes sense. That kind of brings us to our next one that we have is that like in, it's kind of like taboo to talk about sex in straight culture like if you were on a first date and a guy like at least as a woman if a guy was talking like overtly sexual to you or talking about sex you would kind of label him as a fuck boy or like a player or you know and just like (laughs) i I, like see matt is just like cracking up but i feel like what we've heard from folks in our community too that are gay that this is just like like it's on like it is like hyper sexualized from the start like one of our uh, members ryan was saying like i actually look for those conversations where it's not all about sex yeah. because like I can have a conversation with this person. So I'd love to hear your take on the difference oh, there. God. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's hilarious. And what was making me laugh is like on Scruff or Grinder on the regular, I will get instead of a hello, or maybe you get just a hi and then a dick pic, dick pic, dick pic. Oh my God. Or profiles will be, you know, I'm like, like seven and a half cut uh girth four inches or whatever and (laughs) you know like bottom or top or i am hiv negative hiv Mm -hmm. positive i'm on prep all that stuff is super forward on the Mm -hmm. apps which i think is actually great so that to me it's just and so i was thinking on this straight day it's like i was just thinking of a guy would easily sometimes be like well how big are you or what's your (laughs) like that would be a conversation topic i think it's easier to hide that behind an app though let me say Mm. so in person, unless you're at a bathhouse, I think it's probably a little harder to just, at least I'm speaking for myself here, but I have a fear of rejection generally as a person. I think a lot of people do. So I think in person, I tend to be, I put walls up really quickly. And I think it's a fear of rejection thing. But yeah, I think, yeah, it's a very different thing in gay land. And I think, (laughs) I think it's constructive because it gets it all out of the way very quickly Mm -hmm. um and again you know you hook up you make friends maybe you have dinner parties together (laughs) or whatever but i was going to say regarding your comment about uh the community member who is saying that you know he waits for the actual conversations to happen um that's what happened with my partner and again i'd said i look for uh sincerity in people as an actual human thing that I'm attracted to that's right. human and not necessarily sexual. And so, you know, with my partner, he we had real conversations early and we actually didn't meet until I think four months after we first started talking because mm-hmm. um, there was another guy in between and all that. But then we actually did. And um, the moment I realized, wow, this is somebody I want to spend time with was just the second time we hung out, which yes, was a hookup. But it wasn't actually, he started just telling me about his day at work. And Mm. so that to me meant a lot and I'll never Mm. forget that. Um, And Mm. it wasn't just about sex. So I do think, you know, I don't know if we can swing this relation in terms of concept, but there are a lot of barriers you can put up with by just having sex and being shallow about it. And like, oh, you didn't see his dick size before you went on a date. Why would you even do that? Like (laughs) that totally is a thing. And I've heard so many conversations like that. I do think that is kind of shallow in the sense of, and I'm not saying that in a bad or good way. I'm just saying like, there is more to life than just sex. So as hypersexualized as it can be, um, we're also still just people. So I think that's an important thing to realize too. But I do think I'm a person that also enjoys the freedom of a much more open sexual atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And I think it's much more healthy, you know, than being ashamed of it and keeping it all like hush hush. So have you ever heard the phrase fuck like a man told to a woman? (laughs) No, not told to a woman. (laughs) That's interesting. We hear that. I mean, I think it was on Sex in the City. And I think it was on. um, It's been in numerous like media and shows and all that stuff. And I've been told that by friends is like, I think 
we do a lot of times as women, we do equate sex to emotional connection and it's hard for us to separate the two. So to reconcile that, we've been told, well, fuck like a man, just (laughs) get in, get out and don't think about it. Who tells you that out of curiosity? Like media. other women or men? Media. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yep. I'm not judging this statement because because it obviously works for some people, but it's really hard for me to separate the two. Even if I tell myself, mm-hmm. just fuck like a man. Like I, I can't just do that. What are your thoughts on even that statement? You feel I feel like you're pretty surprised by even a statement like well, that. Well, it seems kind of to support the patriarchy of like <laughs> mm. I don't know, of like putting it putting it all on the man's man's point of view again mm-hmm. in terms of what like the way to do it yeah fuck like a man so to me it do, it discounts your experience and tells you to put a cap on yourself and that to me is kind of maybe harmful that's my initial thought i've never really heard that phrase before so pardon me if that's a pointless thought that i just had not at all at least what i've experienced before it's like hard for me to have sex with someone until i have that emotional connection okay yeah. but it sounds like i mean in gay culture it's pretty common to meet someone right away and have <laughs> sex so yeah. assuming you don't yeah <laughs> common in my gay culture okay. um <laughs> and i think <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, again, it's a way that men can get close to each other, but also it's a, you break that ice right away. Mm -hmm. I think, I think being a guy, at least this is my experience, you see someone you're into or that you might be into or whatever, and there's suddenly sexual tension and you might be imagining it in your head. Best to get that out of the way so you can actually get to know somebody. That's kind of the like, you know, we can debate whether that's healthy or not, but I think in my experience it is because it, removes this, you know, I think there is a lot of, this might be a carryover from straight culture um, or religious culture, I'm not sure, but, you know, putting a lot of emphasis on sex. So we're, if we're talking about relationships, the reality tends to be you get busy, you get, you know, it's been four years or however long, and it's like sex isn't the be all end all of life. And oddly, my parents always like talked about that, you know, in a positive light, I think of like, well, sex isn't you know, an over-focus on sex can be harmful and stuff like that. And I actually, you know, I see their point. Mm. Um, At the same time with Catholicism, you know, I grew up where there was an over-focus on sex in a negative light. So it was kind of interesting that that had like sex in a healthy way was not over-focused on, but it was almost the opposite. Yeah. I mean, I think another thing that's been out there too is, I mean, I guess like in a long-term relationship, right? Like, do you find, because I think there is myths, and I'm not saying this is true for straight people either, but there's a myth like once you've been married, you don't have a sex life anymore and it all like kind of goes to shit. (laughs) (laughs) And um, like, I know in gay culture, even like open relationships are a lot more common than in straight culture. Like, do you feel like you turn to to open relationships because like long-term sex fizzles out or is it more just culturally it's something that you do i can only speak for myself on this because i know a lot of people who don't subscribe to that model Mm -hmm. um so i've always known about myself well always known since my late 20s that i would be like a caged puppy in a closed relationship and i don't want that Mm -hmm. and i don't think for me it's natural Mm -hmm. so you could argue that it's not natural for many people uh, because they're always looking or they're cheating or they're getting divorced or whatever it's something i always kind of wanted to you know in my 30s be true to about myself so i think it's definitely common i don't know many gay couples who are closed, um, at least here in San Francisco. And even I would say in Minneapolis, where I lived before, most couples were open that I knew or closed and cheating on each other. That happened quite a bit. I once accidentally hooked up with two members of the same couple at different times and didn't know it. (laughs) And then I found out later that they were together. And I was, you know, I felt bad because I was like, oh, you guys were lying to each other. I didn't know that that was, you know, so we didn't talk about it, but it was just me processing like, oh, 
you know, so there are things like, I think there's a vast spectrum of experience in the gay community, but with most pe- people I know, open relationship is kind of a standard. Um, mm-hmm. And it does, I think, free up the, you know, the relationship, like you're going to ebb and flow with your sexuality, with your partner and people change. And something we talked about, I think, Julie, in the past is like the um, trust that can be built with an open relationship is an entirely mm-hmm. different type of trust that a closed relationship would can build, not better or worse, but I think different. If you know that your partner is out hanging out with some dude or some friend that they hook up regularly, but you know that your partner is coming home to you and like you really are a team together, that's pretty powerful to me. And it's it does go back to what I said about or what we were discussing about sex not being the be all end all mm-hmm. of a relationship. Um, and so for me, it's become it's important for me to have an open relationship because uh, I know myself. I don't want to disappoint somebody worse than I already might <laughs> as a person. And I like to try to be honest about that. And it, it by removing the uh, catastrophic nature of quote, quote, cheating, because you're not really cheating if it's an agreed right. you know, dynamic, mm-hmm. there's no like instant breakup when someone has sex with somebody else. And if, you know, in a different relationship, I'm um, actually, I was single, but I ended up being the third third uh, with somebody who's now one of my best, best friends. And all three of us had to sit down and talk because feelings started developing between my mm. friend and I and or my friend and me. And the interesting part about that experience was being able to sit down with uh, his partner, who's also a friend, and talk openly about what was happening and how do we deal with it. And then my friend and I also had those talks. And ultimately, we didn't shake anything up. It was just stay friends and stay close to each other. And love will always be there no matter what. And that's something sex really has nothing to do with. <laughs> so it was interesting that it started with sex, but it's a it's just a different array of experiences that that I've had by not being as traditional as some other people. So for me, I love it, but it's not for everybody. So again, we're not speaking for huge populations here. We're only speaking from our own opinion and experiences. But I think there is a lot that the hetero culture can learn from the gay culture as Mm -hmm. well. So maybe we can kick off some takeaways of what we've learned from this conversation. (laughs) I think a major takeaway for me is I have always tied sex to shame. And I need to get to the root of why that is. And I think you bring up this point of like, look at your upbringing look at your family. What what were the messages that were given to you? How did they explain how you got to this world? Yep. <laughs> and I remember my parents just sat me down in front of a TV and was like, watch this VHS. It was a VHS at that point. And it was about the birds and the bees. And then they never wanted to talk about it again. Right. They were just like, yep, that's it. So I never want to talk. And so to me, it was like this, um, it was like this door that they never wanted to open. So when I did open the door, I was like, damn, I'm so behind. I need yep. to learn yep. so much more. And I I felt think similarly too. a lot of straight people are having that sort of epiphany. It's like, I see mm-hmm. the door, I've opened it just a little bit, but what is fully behind it? Let me really discover what that is. Yep. And it's interesting you bring that up. I was at a wedding in Minnesota of one of my friends and one of the guests, of course, I didn't know her and we got talking and we started talking about sex and open relationships. And so what does that say? I'm not sure. But <laughs> she was saying kind of similarly, like her and she's married, I think she was saying she thinks a lot of straight people want to have these conversations Mm -hmm. about open relationships and what that would mean but a lot of people are afraid of what it would mean and again Mm -hmm. I'm just quoting her but I think it was very interesting for me to hear that it kind of reminded me of me growing up as a kid being terrified of what it would mean to be gay Mm -hmm. and have that whole different life that I I couldn't even envision because I was so scared and it kind of a similar feel to that Um, so I thought that was really interesting and it kind of aligned with what you were saying so yeah that actually kind of goes into my takeaway is I kind of feel like I mean part of why I think even in straight culture in San Francisco there is more openness with polyamory Mm -hmm. there is more openness with open relationships and sex as a whole as in other parts of the world and country and I think some of it stems because gay culture was so prominent here right I think there Mm -hmm. is like an element that I almost feel like gays are in the future like your book right (laughs) tying it full back we're leading the world towards sin and (laughs) despair (laughs) just kidding (laughs) but like you said a really good point it's like why do we have this overemphasis on why sex is bad, but not Mm -hmm. why sex is good. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've learned from this conversation is that shame and all the like 
downside of sex shows up differently for different people. And again, like I, we're not generalizing all gay or all straight people based off the three yeah. of our experiences. But even just looking at the three of us, like we all experienced it in different ways, but it was the same emotions that played in at the end yeah. of the day. And I think that part is really fascinating to me that there is so much that's different about how the cultures operate, but then there's also so much that's similar. And like you brought up this point, like at the end of the day, we're all just human and we're looking for connection yeah. and while some people's views on sex might be more like i think even um you know some of it is the dynamic of genders too but like even as straight folks like certain people don't view sex as a big deal like we had a past guest jared freed that was saying like how do i say that sex to me is like taking a shower where sex to like <laughs> you might be yeah. like this like be all and end all and the start of a glorious relationship and I think the reality yeah. is like everyone just views sex differently and like maybe there are more overarching themes in different cultures but also straight folks are the majority too it isn't a marginalized group so you're ar already going to get various opinions yeah. within that as a whole too and I think we are a lot of times with these like, you know, stereotypes like clinging to the past. And I'm I'm hopeful that gay culture is helping us move <laughs> into a more just, you know, do what works for you type of mode. Yeah, totally. And it's interesting everything you just said. And I, you know, if I have a takeaway, it's that we're all in this same boat in different ways. Mm -hmm. Um so as as different as it can be, as you said, the emotions were all kind of the same. And right. as quote, quote, different as gay culture can be, we're still people just like everybody else. And straight people are, you know, in the same boat, have the same freedom to explore. And it just might not be built into the culture. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, it's a spectrum of experience, if you will. And I think, you know, it, it's not much different, actually. I just think the cultures evolved differently. And, you know, you have your stereotypes of all of it. But I think when you get really down to it, people are much more similar um, than we often give them credit for. So, you know, people might disagree with that. But yeah, it's very interesting. Here, here's a wild thought. I just feel like we need to be able to speak about sex more. And we don't do that. <laughs> we get so shy, we get a little bit uncomfortable. And I also think something happened to my boyfriend and I recently where we sort of talked about each other's sexual history. Like this is something you don't really talk about in hetero relationships. Oh, that's so interesting. You don't want to talk okay. about numbers. You don't want to talk about how many people, <laughs> you don't want to talk about what kind of sex you've had, what kind of sex you liked. But it dawned on me, how would I know if I want to know everything about him? Isn't this a major part of him that I should also get to know? Like maybe he holds yeah. some sort of trauma from previous sexual relationships that I don't know about, where maybe he likes certain things being done to him because it has been done to him in the past. It's another part of my partner that I should be more open about and learn more about. It was a very uncomfortable discussion, but we had mind-blowing sex after. So just saying, <laughs> that's I mean, we just need to just talk more about sex, more that's, freely about yeah, sex. Yeah, that's so interesting. And do you think... Um, I was going to, I had a question. Um, do you think hearing about other people, do you have any insecurities related to that? Um, so many. I know in my experience, okay, like, yeah, in my experience, not, you know, you're going to have different dynamics with different sexual partners and you can't always recreate it with, you know, whoever you're with. So I have personally experienced like, oh, I'm, I must be a terrible boyfriend if I feel differently about. Mm this thing or that um and i i just think it's interesting like and i was just curious if you had you know any negative associations with that discussion or hearing about that is that difficult to hear about in a and it also might actually open a question to do you guys feel as if you possess each other's sexuality or mm. each other in a way um mm. and do you get jealous or how does that because i personally don't really have that experience that often I just love at the end of the interview, Matt's like turning the table. Oh, yeah. I know. You can cut this. And then we're going to roll into this. his podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
it's a it's a heavy heavy conversation because I do associate a lot of insecurities with that. I don't want to picture yeah. my partner with other people. In my mind, we, what we want, <laughs> what we want, what I want is a guy who has had very few sexual experiences but knows what he's doing in bed. You know, and just <laughs> which like is also like impossible, unicorn, right? Yeah. Like how, how could that even be? And I sometimes I look at celebrities and who are like in these movies having these sex scenes and i think about what their spouse thinks how can you watch your partner get it on with someone else so it's my own insecurities that challenge the way i i view you know possession i think possession is a it's a key word here super interesting and i that's um actually at the beginning of my relationship with my partner i was something like i i told him might have been on a hike or something, but I'm like, I don't want anybody to own my sexuality. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not up for sale in that sense, or yeah. like, um, hmm. because I would feel caged. And but at the same time, I'm sure I have insecurities related to will he fall in love with someone better, or mm-hmm. you know, all those things. It's very normal. I'll just speak from my own experience on this quickly. I don't think it's necessarily feeling like someone's owning my sexuality. Like, I don't think about it like that. It's more that we've just been taught all these years that, like, you're kind of like our one and only. And it's like by hearing about the past, like, I mm-hmm. remember, like, my ex would bring up the like his past situations and ask about my past. And I'm like, I just don't want to talk I about know, it. Like, so I don't want to hear about it. But I agree with you, Yue. It's like, why? It does, like, pl- it's part of who they are. As a person I like it's like a weird about it. <laughs> <laughs> but i think that's the thing is though is i think some of it i wonder is like is it the the gender dynamics yeah. with yeah. this you know like i wonder like you a like if you're i know you you don't want to your boyfriend doesn't want to hear from this on the podcast but like if he <laughs> felt the same uncomfortableness oh, absolutely. or absolutely because no it, it's like weird you don't want to hear about your partner having pleasure with other with someone right. else you want so to hear that you're the best they've ever been with and right. you're the end all be all and that's not the case i'm sure my partner's had many times like mind-blowing sex with other people i just don't want to hear about it but i should be open to hearing about it because i can learn from those situations and know what turns my partner on so now that we're back to the dateable podcast, <laughs> <laughs> that was the new the new spinoff. But yeah, no, I think there this whole conversation has been really fascinating, and I'm so glad that we had you come on. Like, we have a lot of gay listeners, we have a lot of people like in the LGBTQ plus community, and I think like just hearing more perspectives from even I think I, I really do think all of our straight audience is going to be super interested in this topic. Like when we put the post up. <laughs> in the group there was already so much commentary and interest so Uh i do think like i think there's just like you said i think you said a really good point that i'll just kind of take home as the final point is like despite differences like we are more similar than we think Mm -hmm. and that goes not just for sexuality it goes for all the different aspects of humanity but again thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me this is so great can you give us like tell us like where people can find your new books and all the stuff that you have coming out Oh, yeah. Um, So Amazon and any bookseller, you can order the books. Um, And then I have a book series. So I have the third book in the series coming out, uh, hopefully end of May. Uh, So that'll be available. And then my website's matthewbuyer.com. And now everyone's going to think I'm a big slut, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) There's no shame in that. No No shame whatsoever. No shaming. (laughs) <laughs> Everyone who knows me knows that. So anyway, it's fine. You're like, there's no secrets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, keep it open. My only last thought is I do have the gays to blame for one thing, and which is <laughs> dick pics. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, Because you know how this went down. We've always thought about like, what are the origins of dick pics? It was some straight guy trying to get a girl. He's sitting with his like gay best friend or something. It was like, dude, how do I, how do I get her to like call me back? How do I get some action? And his gay friend is like, just send her a dick pic. I'm telling you, it works every time. And so he sends her a dick pic and then she probably doesn't respond back. But then he told another friend and they just spiraled Mm -hmm. from there. So I bet that's true. Right. I I swear that's. 
that's the origins yeah. yep. of dick pics. In- it's definitely a thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> we will have to do another episode on that. <laughs> yes, that deserves 45 minutes in itself. It does. <laughs> I agree, though. I think what you said of just getting like loads and loads of dick pics, like on Grinder, like that, just like there's just such a, a negative connotation in straight well, world on that. It, it does make me wonder where people thought of where or why that would be a good idea <laughs> um uh, but you know showing just up their stuff i mean especially in gay culture it makes total sense it's like if that's something that like you were saying you a your friend was like i need to see that like right away yeah. might as well just go right into the <laughs> app your, and just get I mean, shit guess, done that's but, your headshot yeah. that's literally your <laughs> that's headshot what, to get honestly i think it is sometimes <laughs> no i think most of them most of them don't allow that for your front photo but others wait they do let you you do that dig into private albums and stuff like that you can oh you could put that as like i actually got one once on tinder as like a (laughs) primary photo like i was i think it wasn't someone that even sent it to me it was just swiping through i was on bart i was on public transport i'm like ah you know but i think (laughs) they put in rules since then this was like back in 2012 when it first came out it was bottled after grinder so yeah yeah of course (laughs) (laughs) it was horrifying though getting that Especially on Bart, like the last yeah, place you want to think about I didn't about even dicks. have any conversation yeah. <laughs> with this guy, right? It was just his profile pic. Jeez. Anyway, Matt, I mean, I won't I won't be offended if you sent us a dick pic after this recording. It was like <laughs> okay, really good. lovely getting to know you. I'd love Check to know inbox. more about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you I'm too. It was very nice to meet you. you <laughs> Thanks for taking the time. And again, yep. for all of our listeners... We will really appreciate it if you don't send us dick pics because we actually we got one in our email <laughs> once. It was so we weird. Did get what? We did I get totally forgot dick. about it. Shit, oh, PTSD God. is coming back. But yeah, <laughs> don't send us dick pics, but do give us a good rating in Apple Podcasts. Five stars goes a long way, goes way longer than a big dick. So we really appreciate those good Does reviews. It? Okay. <laughs> Depending Depends. on the day. Yeah. On that day. <laughs> and if you would love to share your stories about your own sexuality your journey into sexuality please let us know we're still looking for guests for this season and the next season so we will always like to open that conversation with you and then last but not least we're gonna wrap this up the way we always do the dateable podcast is part of the frolic podcast network Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcast. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag Stay Dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. Configuring the Bluetooth, deciding who controls the music, avoiding potholes, remembering where you parked. Why are simple things sometimes so complicated? Thankfully, with Auto Owners Insurance, getting the right coverage for your vehicle doesn't have to be one of them. Auto Owners works with independent agents who live in your community and answer when you call so you can get back to more important things like remembering if you're on the third or fourth level of the parking garage. That's simple human sense. Ask your independent agent if auto owners make sense for you.